We finished off last week with the Pharaoh saying to Joseph, chapter 41, verse 40, it says, You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. So that's where Joseph is now. And with these, these final chapters, with these last eight chapters, I want you to see for yourself that God's promise to Abraham continues to remain unbroken. Why? Because God takes what is harmful and uses it for good. I'm going to walk through these chapters and I want to draw out two main ideas. Firstly, the mess of sin. And secondly, I want to show the mastery of God. Firstly, the mess of sin. Secondly, the mastery of God. Before I do that, I'm going to pray for us and pray for myself. Father, uh, thank you for your word. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that your word tells us that. Thank you that you love us unconditionally. And it's not based on whether we love you. Father, you are a masterful and generous God. Guide us as we look at your word. And God, we want this time together to give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. The mess of sin. So we come to chapter 42. Thanks for reading that out before, Jess. And what we've just read out and heard is now that the seven years of abundance has just come to an end. And just as the God-given dream had said to Joseph, now it's time for the seven years of famine. Chapter 41, verse 57 reads, And all the world came to Egypt. All the world came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe everywhere. So this is the moment, right? The going gets tough. And now the scene cuts from Joseph and his success, and it now turns to his family, to his father and his brothers who aren't so successful. They're not in a good way. They're facing famine. However, look at, that. Look at how it reads. Look at how it starts. I find it kind of funny. Verse 1 says, When Jacob learned that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, Why do you keep looking at each other? Like, honestly, these guys, they're the biggest bunch of fruitcakes. Jacob's saying, There's no food here, but there is food in Egypt. So probably go from here, where there's nothing, to Egypt, where there is something. It would be a good idea, boys. And they don't have a choice. It's in, they're in a severe famine. So Jacob, he sends them on their way to get grain. However, he intentionally doesn't send his youngest son, Benjamin. Read with me verse 4. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, brother, Joseph's brother rather, with the others, because he was afraid that harm might come to him. So immediately we're told that this is still tender for Jacob. It's been almost over two decades now, and yet Jacob is still, and rightfully so, devastated at the loss of his son Joseph. And he's petrified at the thought of losing yet another son. However, the, the, the famine is severe, so Jacob says to them, off you go, go to Egypt, boys. And immediately they turn up to Egypt, and then this scene plays out, right? Joseph sees them. And not only that, he recognizes them. What a moment. I want you to imagine that with me. Imagine being Joseph. You've been fully abandoned and rejected by, by your own brothers. And over 20 years later, here they are, verse 6, bowed down in t to him with their faces to the ground. What would you do at this moment? What would you do in this situation? If it was me, I'd have handed it to him. I reckon, like, no tomorrow, I'd have laid it out so thick. I'd have revealed myself. I'd be like, it's me, Joseph, hi. And I'd probably have said, you know what? You've come for food. I'm now in charge of it all. There's none here for you, though. And I'd have sent them packing, probably with their own shame to eat. Anyway, that gets a bit dark. I shouldn't go too far down that. But here they are, right? The brothers um, that plan to kill you are now unknowingly bowing before you. This is playing out exactly as God said it would to Joseph in a dream in chapter 37. But what takes place next is really interesting. Essentially, Joseph tests his brothers. He brings them to an end of themselves, to a point of confrontation with what they've done. And we'll soon see that Joseph's intention 
is in fact to forgive them. Again, that would be hard for me. Firstly, however, he was waiting for his brothers to acknowledge exactly what they had done to him. And, and look, what, look what Joseph says. He goes on to say in verse 15 of chapter 42, And this is how you will be tested. As surely as Pharaoh lives, you will not leave this place until your youngest brother comes here. He, he's put his finger on a tender spot, hasn't he? And in response to this, the brothers are in turmoil. They know the devastation that they brought to their father at losing Joseph, or now at the thought of losing another son. And all of this stems from the heartbreak from losing Joseph in the first place 20 years ago. Verse 38, Jacob goes on to say, essentially, it'll kill me if harm comes to my youngest son, Benjamin. And like Ray showed us last week, Genesis 37 tells us these brothers, they were engulfed in, in pride, in jealousy, in hatred for Joseph. Come with me, read verse 8 of chapter 37. It says, his brothers said to him, Joseph, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Look at how the brothers respond to Joseph's testing. Read with me verse 21. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished for our brother. We saw how distressed he, Joseph, was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. And that's why the distress has come on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you to not sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an account for his blood. Their response is interesting, isn't it? It's, uh, it's very tit for tat. And without sounding too fancy, what we're seeing here is they're holding to a retributional understanding with God. Because that they've done wrong, God is dealing with them here and now in punishment and in response to their actions. However, as the story unfolds, the very one they sold off, Joseph, happens to be the one in power and empower and willingness to feed them, to sustain them, and to save them. What is evident in these verses is that these brothers are faced with the reality of their sin. They're backed into a corner, and they're forced to face their actions. Joseph, like I said before, has put a finger on a tender spot, and the brothers are confronted with what they've done. However, still at this point, Joseph hasn't revealed himself. And he won't for some time yet. And you know why? Because through Joseph, God is giving the brothers more time to confront their sin, to recognize it, to confess it, and to call it for what it is. Why? So that they might be reconciled and forgiven. Now, don't get me wrong. If, uh, if I were to have a dream one night and I, and I come down one morning for breakfast and I've got my 10 brothers around me and my parents are there. I can't imagine this scenario, but try. And I come down and I'm sitting at the dinner at the breakfast table and I say to them, guys, you'd never believe what happened last night. I had a dream and all of you were there. And in fact, I was in charge of all of you guys and you were all bowing down to me and it was a dream from God. So, you know, it's going to happen. Hey, Reuben, you know, pass the juice or whatever. Could you imagine that conversation? Could you imagine that scenario playing out? If, I, if it was me, I think rightfully so, I'd, I'd probably be pretty annoyed with Joseph. And it's something to say that we all would be. But regardless of the response, um, regardless, the response for the brothers should not have been, let's go kill him. And furthermore, to go sell him and leave him for dead. Over the next two chapters of Genesis 43 and 44, we see the brothers and we see them go back and forth to Egypt. And on their second trip, they go with their younger brother, Benjamin. And as they do so, it's then that they're faced with the heartbreak, the heartbreak that they've caused to their father. Church, sin, sin has consequences. It causes heartbreak. And I want to stop there for a minute and say... God's heart breaks at the sadness of sin. Sin is messy. 
And God sees this and he's devastated by the mess of, of our sin against each other and ultimately against God. God knew for these brothers, and I want to open it up and say, God knows for us today that we need to be confronted with our sin. We need to come to a realization of what we have done. And now I'm going to speak big picture for a second. You, we, all of us have turned our backs on God. Whether you've said it explicitly or not, our actions daily uh, imply and show that we want nothing to do with God and we want everything to do with ourselves. We want it to go our way. We want our plans to succeed. We want our comforts. We want our control. We want our revenge. We want our justice. We want our lemonade. And we want to take everything into our own hands. And like the brothers, until we realize how wrong we've gone, it's only then do we realize how much God has forgiven us from. Look now in this story. See the mastery of God. See the glory of God and what he does with the chaos and with the mess of sin. And so we come to point two, the mastery of God and chapter 45. After the brothers have been confronted with their sin, we come to chapter 45 where Joseph essentially says, enough's enough. It's time. I've got to let them know who I am. Read with me. Chapter 45, verses 1 to 4. Then Joseph could no longer control himself. And before all his attendants, he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence, so that there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, the Pharaoh's household, household heard about him. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But the brothers weren't able to answer because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come closer to me. And when they did so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. But look at this, right? Immediately after Joseph reveals himself, he says, now, don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Come on, <laughs> because it was to save, this is what Joseph goes on to say, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. What a scene. Again, put yourself there. Imagine being one of the brothers and Joseph said, well, Joseph rather, that the brother you sold into slavery 22 years ago is now standing in front of you in charge of it all. And now imagine him saying, don't be distressed. Oh, I'd be distressed out of my mind. But look at what he says here again, verse 5. Because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Friends, this is the mastery of God. It's that he takes the most horrendous, harmful actions and uses them for good. Nothing for God is too far gone. No one for God is too far gone. He takes the hardship, he takes the sadness, he takes the brokenness of our lives, of this world, and he brings about his good plan. And what's his good plan? It's to save lives. The whole story of Joseph shows God's hand as he takes the devastating decisions of Joseph's brothers to then use Joseph to offer hope to a starving world and to a starving family. And it's funny because on first reading, I think to myself, oh my, those brothers, they are rank. Like who would do such a thing? But on second reading, I realize I am the brother. We are the brothers. And in the same way the brothers rejected Joseph is the same way we have rejected Jesus. Yet, he takes on the death we deserve in order to rise again, offering hope to a starving and desperate people, spiritually a starving and desperate me. Now quickly, I want to make an important distinction. There are, there are difficulties in life that are a result of our sin. For example, if I rob a bank, I'm going to end up in jail. That's fair. That's justice. And that's a direct consequence of my actions. However, there are some hardships in life that have nothing to do with our sin specifically and our actions. And they're simply a result of being in a broken world. 
simply a result of living in a broken world. And for some of us here today, you might be in some of the hardest times of your life. And I want to say to you today that God hasn't forgotten you, that you are not alone. And in particular, I think about the Kutri family right now, who are in some of the most difficult times of their lives. And I guess I want to say to them, God's heart breaks with you guys. And like Joseph and Jesus, who felt the weight of their experience, so can we. Like Joseph and Jesus, who also felt and wept, so can we. What we see in the story of Joseph, and like we see in God's character, is that God brings purpose out of pain. I hope that's that's helpful for someone here today. I hope that's timely. Does God want pain? No. No. Is God simply mechanical and plan-driven when it comes to Joseph's pain, when it comes to your pain today? No. God's heart breaks for the sadness of this world. And God doesn't hide away in the face of hardships. It feels like it. Sometimes it feels like God's so far away. But in fact, he's on the front foot. God's on the front foot with a plan to bring redemption from brokenness. As the brothers in the story of Joseph are confronted with their sin, Joseph is right there, ready to offer forgiveness. And in the same way as we confront our sin, God is right here, ready to offer forgiveness. John 1.9 tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Church, there is power in being transparent and in being honest about our sin. However, the power isn't in our confession. It's in what God does with it. He forgives. My favorite verse, Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man, Jesus, came to seek and to save what was lost. Our salvation is found in his seeking. It's found in his coming. It's found in his saving. And I want to ask you today to come to him. Be honest. Be transparent about our our sin, our lives, our, our ignorance of him. And I want you to know today that God's grace welcomes you with open arms. I've heard it said the grace of God saves us where we are, but the grace of God doesn't leave us where we are. God saves and he transforms. And as we pick up the Bible and let God start speaking to us, and as you come to him in prayer with the daily decisions of life, get ready. Get ready for God to start shaping, to start transforming you into someone who looks more and more like Jesus. This is an honor and this is a good thing. Church, we're saved with a purpose and we suffer with a purpose. So you know what's good, friends, is that sin and brokenness, they don't have the last word. God does. And I hope that offers comfort for you today. So when we face negative health reports, when we face difficulties at work, financial complications, loss of relationships or or any other kind of sadness, pain and hardship, the Christian is able to say and have confidence that my God has a plan and that plan involves the saving of many lives. And even though I might not understand it or I don't know how long I might be in it for, I do get to know that God's plan, like I said, involves the saving of many lives. God takes what is harmful and he uses it for good. And as the story of Joseph continues, Jacob turns up to the city of Egypt, Joseph's dad turns up. And look at what Pharaoh says. Verse 5 of chapter 47. Come with me. Your father and your brothers, verse 5, your father and your brothers have come to you. And the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know any of them with special ability, Any among them with special ability put them in charge of my own livestock. 
Joseph, at this moment, is then reunited with his father, which results in Joseph breaking down, emotions boil to the surface. Gentlemen, real men cry. And that's the whole point of today's, just kidding, it's not. But that's an important one, real men cry. And notice here what Pharaoh says. He says, settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Now, this is the opposite of the brothers' retribution theology that I was talking about before, this understanding of God that they've done wrong. However, it's the opposite. Yet God's plan to bless prevails. And after 17 years, so come with me now to chapter 49, after 17 years of Joseph's dad and brothers living in the land, Jacob nears his death. And he gives his final word to each of his sons, which carries power as God's promise to Abraham endures. It remains unbroken. Look at what Jacob says to Judah, verse 8 of chapter 49. Judah, your brothers will praise you and your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons will bow down to you. You are a lion's cub, Judah. You return from the prey, my son. And like a lion, he crouches and he lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he who, to whom it belongs shall come the, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Do you know what's most beautiful? about this story of Joseph is that God's promise remains unbroken. God's promise of descendants to Abraham, even amidst the sin of Jacob, even amidst the sin of his sons, Joseph's brothers, God God continues to provide. And he does that by providing through the rejected, sold brother of Joseph. So a chance to be reconciled and forgiven with those brothers would come to be and then lead to the line of Jesus. And you may think, surely, surely God's promise uh, of descendants would continue through the line of Joseph. That would be right. That would make sense given the focus of this story. However, that's not what God's plan was. All the more we see that God continues to make a way through the broken. In a picture in a big picture, though, and this time and here rather, we see that it's through the flawed man of Judah. The man Grant spoke to us two weeks back, this, this twisted man. It's through him that the line, it's the line of Judah rather, that leads to the birth of Jesus. You know what? This is the greatest scandal of it all. And somewhat, it's the whole point of the story of Joseph. Humanity makes a mess of it. But God makes a way through it. This reinforces the character of God who takes the harmful and uses it for good. It is through the broken, harmful man called Judah that God would decide to use Joseph to reconcile with his brothers, save them from the famine, all that so that it would lead to the life-giving man called Jesus. This is who God is. This is the mastery of God. And now as we come to the final chapter of Genesis, look now what takes place. Joseph's father dies, Jacob, and it brings out the tears of a real man once more. And after Joseph and Egypt mourn for 40 days, look at this, it's really interesting. Look at the immediate response of his brothers. Verse 15 of chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, what if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? This is outstanding. It's been 40 years now since they have sold Joseph or around this number. And yet still there is fear and concern for their own lives. Sin entangles us. It is Um, intoxicating. So Joseph comes to his brothers and look at what he says. Once again, terrified. The brothers are terrified at the thought of Joseph having all the power and being able to bring revenge. Yet this is what Joseph says to him. He says, 
come with me, 50 verse 20, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Now, it's incredibly, this is a, this is a really important one to note. Just before you run straight out of here and, and go to someone who's in an immense amount of pain and you say to them, God will use it for good, God bless, see you next Sunday. The one who's experienced pain, Joseph, is the one that's declaring God's intention for good. Church, this truth isn't to be used insensitively. Pain is hard. Hardships hurt. And it's the realization for the one who's in hardship that God hasn't forgotten them and that he's working for the good, the good of saving many lives. Just as I bring it to a close, I want to show you one more incredible aspect of the story of Joseph. Ray touched on this last week. We we are meant to look at the story of Joseph and see through the line of Judah to Jesus. But we're also meant to look at the man of Joseph and see the, sto- and see the man of Jesus. Joseph was a man sent by God who trusted God and as a result was rejected, was mocked, was sold by the very ones he called brothers. And in case you're not familiar with the story of Christ, this is exactly what happened to Jesus. John 1, 11 reads, He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The Gospels go on to record Jesus as a man who was sent by God, who trusted God, and who was God. And he was rejected, he was mocked, he was flogged, and according to Mark 8, 9, and 10, Jesus predicted that he was to be left to die on a cross, sentenced by the very people who were meant to be his brothers. The very people who knew the story of Joseph, who knew the God who turns tragedy to triumph. Can you see the parallels? The beauty is this. God took what is harmful in the death of Jesus and he used it for the ultimate good. The saving of many lives. And through the raising of of Jesus from the dead, he brought salvation to a starving world. Read John 1, 11 again with me, and then 12. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, verse 12, yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. This is the good news. The book of Genesis starts with with God creating a a humanity in a world where food was of abundance. And then the end of Genesis lands with God sending a man to a world that's starving. We're meant to see from the story of Joseph that in the same way God took the harm of Joseph, yet put him into a position of offering hope for a starving world, is the same way God took the harm of Jesus and put him into a position of offering hope. The world hoped by salvation. God takes what is harmful and he uses it for good, the saving of many lives. Just before I pray, I want to leave you with one verse that the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8.28. He says, In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called, who have been called according to his purpose. How good is this? Father, I thank you for who you are. God, uh, your heart breaks at the sadness of this world, so much so that you bring life from the ashes. You redeem even our own sin towards you, God. And we want to come to you. We confess our sin and we rejoice knowing that you make a way Father, you take what is harmful and you use it for good. God, thank you for sending your son Jesus to seek and to save us, to seek and to save the lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.